I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am the editor at TheRinger.com and joining me in the studio, he can't believe he got cut out of Infinity War. It's Andy Greenwald. Listen, it's not determined yet. There's still some, <laughs> yeah. it's a fluid situation. Andy, we're going to talk quickly about the Avengers Infinity War trailer, mm-hmm. but we have a very special show today. Yes, we're very excited to welcome not one guest, not two guests, but three guests to talk about the new Hulu Marvel TV show, Runaways, based on what I think is one of the best comics of the last 15, 20 years, uh, Brian K. Vaughn's Runaways. And we have a very unique interview because not only do we have the creators of the TV show, Josh Schwartz and Stephanie Savage, who you know from The O.C. and Gossip Girl and many other shows on your television boxes, but we also have Brian K. Vaughn, the creator of the comic. And they've done no press together to talk about how they got along, how they worked together, how they made changes or didn't make changes. So it was really cool to have them all in to talk about the process of bringing Runaways from comic to screen. So we're going to get to that. But it's kind of just a Marvel show today, right? It is. We got to talk about this Infinity War trailer really quickly. Because Chris has takes. Let me tell you guys just a little window into our life here. Chris has been texting me about memes. <laughs> just letting, making sure I know, I know I'm up on the memes. But he's also been texting me about Josh Brolic's appearance in this Josh trailer. Josh Brolic, man. First of all, so we've been building to Infinity War for 10 years, right? We personally, as well, well as the Marvel, culture. This is where it's all going. And now they have actually, the reason why I'm like, actually have some, my temperatures up on this is mm-hmm. because they're like, everything changes in Infinity War. Everything, the stakes get raised mm-hmm. finally. Because I think that you've even seen a couple of things where it's like, there aren't really any consequences in the Marvel universe, you know, like they're or in, right. in the in the Disney Marvel but, universe. But much like comic books where Wolverine dies and everyone gets excited and buys the issue. And then 18 months later, Wolverine. Sure, back. Exactly. Nothing really can change. In right. A and I think that it's important to recognize that, like, in a lot of the things that we talk about within genre, with especially within superhero or sci fi. That our concept of, like, consequences can be a little bit mm-hmm. thrown out of whack. But. Uh, I was just laughing to myself watching the Infinity War trailer, which looks fine, and it sure. looks like I will be very, very interested to see how they manage the more than a dozen major movie star speaking parts they have to shuffle around. Much more than a dozen. Is the fact that one of the things that we've always talked about is Marvel has a villain problem. Mm-hmm. There's not a mm-hmm. convincing enough heavy in mm-hmm. this universe to balance out all the good, to the extent that they've even had to, with Civil War, had to try and find tension from within the group of Make the of heroes Avengers, villains. Right. Um, but Thanos, Thanos is supposed to uh, mm. change all of that. <laughs> and I lolled. Yeah. <laughs> I, I audibly guffawed at the first shot of Josh Brolic. Pounding this pavement. It's a problem. Yeah, man. It's for real a problem. And he it, looks like a Pixar gorilla. They, the thing is this, when they first, I mean, it, the whole trailer is about the experiment. It's very, yeah. it's meta in a way. It's basically the trailer is about, you know, Nick Fury's voice and all their voice saying like, we, we wondered if we could do this. Like there was a, a question asked yeah. and an answered and we brought all these totally disparate heroes together. Remember when this all still felt a little cagey and uncertain and they were just suggesting these things would be linked in the, this, the, the, the tags at the end of the films. We first saw Thanos in the first Avengers movie, which is five years ago. It'll have been six years when Infinity War comes out. And he wasn't even played by, by Josh then. Yeah. He was just a CGI creation. Yeah. And it was really just a, you know, they, it was a, they were casting a line in the water saying, this is a villain from the comic books. We will spend the next six years telling you about him, making you fear him, hopefully casting him. And concurrently in the comic books, we're going to make him a big deal again and hope that that sort of trickles up. But then it was like, well, here's this big purple guy from space who's in love with death. Yeah. We are at a point now with the movies, with especially the Marvel movies, where they feel so indestructible. It could have been just Josh Josh Brolin and Brolin. I'm saying Brolin. Josh <laughs> Brolin in his uh, uh, No Country for Old Men costume. And it would be it would be fine in a way. Probably, I don't yeah. know he needs to be purple with the ridge chin anymore. Yeah. You know, what I mean, I feel like we've moved past fealty to the. Comics and I think the other thing is this, this it, is going to be a little bit of a schism because I don't care about in, Infinity Stones. I don't understand it's, them. It's a great point. And does anyone care? When he's like, check out, ch- check I'm, out I'm, these rings. I'm like, you ain't Kobe. I don't know what we're talking you d- about. You don't respect the jewelry. <laughs> I just don't understand what they do. At the end of the trailer, he's got two championships. <laughs> With three more to come. <laughs> okay. Are you kidding me? Yeah, Look, so I'm, I'm, I'm it, like, 
aside from the fact that like it looks like there's 37 people in this movie, at least it's also just like I'm like I don't really care about the stakes, he, he, but he, I'm he, obviously gonna he, see it. The thing about this movie, in the trailer, is that for whatever, whether it's good or bad, it seems like a movie. Like it seems like a, its own movie with its own point of view. When Thor shows up in this movie, he does not seem like the same dude who was lolling with everybody in Ragnarok. Right? It just seems like this is its thing, where we, we're worried about this, the fate of the world again, and everyone's gonna gather together. A lot of friends are gonna be there. Fine. Fine. It also makes sense stakes wise because unlike Justice League, this has been building. They have made, they have been building to this point where now maybe we actually will have some stakes in it and have and care to some degree about what happens to these people. But look, I gotta say, when the time when it's time to talk about the movie, we'll talk about the movie and we'll judge it on its artistic merits. Yeah. At this moment, I am just kind of impressed by. I, I feel like uh, uh, Ron Burgundy when his dog <laughs> eats the cheese. Honestly, because they are just like, here's the largest thing you've ever seen, and we pulled it off. And this week also, uh, Vanity Fair has these multiple covers of like, we got all these stars they together. Did. Joanna Robinson. And Joanna yeah. Robinson, who is one of our favorite online culture writers, she does this interview. And I mean, no disrespect to anyone involved when I say no news is broken in this. The news is that they took these photos. The news is that they got them all together. The story has become, they, they control the story to such a staggering degree that before you take your I, I'm taking off whatever journalism cap I still own and just being like I just I'm just impressed with the hustle man sure. there's no story here other than Kevin Feige being like admitting that all their contracts are going to lapse after the after <laughs> Avengers 4 and it's just going to be a lot of Tom Holland and Benedict Cumberbatch hanging out I can't wait all right uh let's get to our interview with Stephanie Savage Josh Schwartz and Brian K. Vaughn and we're talking about Runaways which is on Hulu now you can watch the first four episodes new episodes premiere every Tuesday in season one and by the way we didn't say this so much in the interview Go to your comic book store, if you have access to one, and get uh, Runaways Volume 1, which captures uh, issues 1 through 18. Even if you're not a big comic book person, this is a great comic book and obviously led to a really uh, interesting TV show that we're going to discuss now. Here's our interview with Brian K. Vaughn, Stephanie Savage, and Josh Schwartz. So let's get into it. And this uh, is truly the first time yeah, we've this, all been yeah, really excited yeah, talking yeah. about the show. So we have no idea what Brian is going to say so, about So us. Josh and Stephanie, you have been doing press for the show yeah. as the adapters, creators yep. of Runaways, the yep. television show for Hulu. Brian K. Vaughn is here with us as well. Hi. Welcome. Thanks the creator of the comic book. First time doing press together. This is exciting. It Will is. the sparks fly? <laughs> Will the, tr- the truth come out? Well, Brian, out. yeah. I'm going to air all of my grievances. They're going to happen here. This yeah. is the perfect place for it. It is the festivist season. Um, we are going to talk about the show, of course, and a little bit about the comic book. But since we have all of you here, we really wanted to make it more of a conversation about um, adaptation and sort of how this works. Interesting. And the best way to start. I Wish I had known that ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to keep you on your toes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the best way to start is with Runaways the comic itself. And so that means turning to Brian and, and asking you about it. Because I, I remember um, reading the comic, falling in love with it over, was it 12 years ago when it came out, right? 04, 05? Uh, 2003. 2003 it was three when it was first published. Yeah, yeah. And I remember a friend of mine who worked in TV saying about the Runaways that this is the single best original idea Marvel has had in 30 years. Oh, that's uh, nice. And then saying, I can't believe Brian gave it to Marvel, <laughs> <laughs> which is a whole separate thing. But can you talk about um, just sort the Cliff Notes version of how the series came to be? Yeah, so I guess it was probably around 2001 or 2002, and uh, I was a struggling young comic book writer, and I heard that Marvel was looking for teen books, and I didn't really like any of their existing teenage books, so I I thought I would just throw something new onto the pile and Mm -hmm. see if it stood a chance. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to think both what was a comic that felt very... 21st century, but also felt like a Marvel book. And uh, yeah, so Runaways is just trying to reverse engineer what Stan Lee and Jack Kirby would do, try and come up with a, a really hooky idea, but that had something to say about society and was hopefully a little bit more subversive than DC Comics. And it was kind of an interesting moment at Marvel because they were trying a lot of new things, throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. And you were able to make this series without any existing connection to the Marvel Universe, mostly, right? I mean, Captain America's on the first page, yeah, but I, it's not really him. I I, um, I was never good at those kind of events where you had to work closely with other books and uh, collaborate, and I just thought if we... I'm not <laughs> good, I'm not good to play with others. Yeah. Well, we but can I, vouch for that, actually. <laughs> 
I thought if we set it in Los Angeles, it would just be a way that the kids would kind of know that Captain America and Spider-Man exist, but kind of the way that like growing up in Cleveland that I knew celebrities existed, but you wouldn't actually run into them. So I thought we would have our own little corner of the Marvel Universe. I, until the Avengers film filmed in Cleveland. <laughs> of course. Yeah, <laughs> weirdly enough. Squaring. Yeah, completing the cycle. The square in the circle. For Josh and Stephanie, how did you guys encounter the book? Uh, I mean, because this has been sort of a holy grail of, of, as an adaption for, mm-hmm. and, and I was wondering, how did you pitch your vision to Marvel? First encountered the book around when it came out, which was, I believe, the first year of the of the OC as well. And we were saying it may have been Heinberg. Was that who turned you on to it? It was. Yeah, I must have mm-hmm. been who, who first put it in front of me and said, you must read this book. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first time I read it, I just was like, I, I don't know who Brian is, but this is my people. It was just speaking to me in a way that no other book had, just the references and the, the characters and the emotional lives of the characters um, and the sort of this metaphor, you know, the, using the story as a metaphor of, of parents and kids and telling this family drama. Um, because I realize we should say for people who are listening to this podcast who don't know what we're talking about, the oh, yes. central conceit of the show is a bunch every, of kids. Yeah. Every teenager thinks their parents are evil. What if her parents actually were? Right. Oh, that's a good. That's good. That's, you should, that's Brian's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but the way the way it just floated, you should well, work in Hollywood. Thank <laughs> By the way, I, I've said that sentence thousands of times, and only recently people have said, you know, not every teenager thinks their parents are evil. And I always thought that line was a slam dunk, like, right? We all thought. People like, no, I had a very healthy, normal relationship with so, my yeah. parents. So you're out there being so, like, we all passageways. Yeah, yeah, I thought yeah. everyone will be able to identify with this concept, and only now I'm finding out some people think it's very strange. So, <laughs> sorry. But it's funny that everyone— but that is part of what we wanted to explore, which is that not all kids would have the same reaction to seeing their parents do this terrible thing. And for some kids— their parents being evil makes the most sense and actually explains quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And other kids in the in the story couldn't conceive of that at all yeah. and the complications that would ensue. The it, it seemed like, you know, right from when the book was published that this could translate to other mediums even before we're, we entered into this era where everything that Marvel has published is becoming something uh, one way or another. Can can you guys sort of talk about the journey? I, I know they, Marvel was trying to adapt it for a while um, as a movie, uh, then obviously Marvel TV became a thing. Where was the property? I guess I'll put it to you, Stephanie. Like, where was the property when you guys came into it? Well, it had been on the when we originally sat down with Marvel. It was as a general. It was because we had just moved over to ABC from Warner Brothers, and we were like, they have Marvel. We should go talk to them. Mm-hmm. And uh, we sat down with Jeff Loeb and Megan Bradner, and Jeff very politely but forcefully laid out the fact that they had this like plan to launch. Six shows, it was going to happen in a very specific order, and they re- weren't really thinking about Runaways, and that was, maybe it was we still on the We were talking about Runaways. Yeah. They were yeah, just was, only talking about, this. yeah. But this and, was the Daredevil plan, the, the yeah. Defenders yeah. plan. And we were just like, we left that meeting going, great, we'll like check back in in 15 years yeah, when right. they have like all these shows launched. You, and didn't, then, you didn't immediately pitch Teen Punisher? <laughs> <laughs> and then they were able to actually execute that plan in like 18 months. So uh, and then we, we came heard, back. Yeah, we heard that it moved from features to that it was no longer in feature development and television uh, was going to have a crack at it. So we immediately went in and wanted to plant our flag and, you know, and pitch our, sing for our supper with it. And we didn't realize that we went in for that meeting. They were thinking the same thing, that Jeff and Megan were also wanted to talk runaways with us. So, And Brian, like, obviously everyone knows that the idea of creator's rights, it's a tricky business in comic books mm-hmm. uh, in general. Um, how did all three of you navigate this? Because, Brian, I imagine um, there have been versions of this long story where you maybe were going to be more involved, um, versions where maybe you wanted to just walk away completely. Uh, you seem to have found, at least at the beginning of this interview, a happy medium. Yeah, <laughs> no, we'll see how the rest of the interview goes. No, it's the best. I, I mean, I knew when I created it uh, with Adrian Alfona, mm-hmm. the artist, who I should say is very much an equal co-creator mm-hmm. in this, that it, it didn't belong to us. We were giving something to Marvel. And at the time, as a young writer, I'd made a great living writing other people's characters. So I didn't object to uh, creating something that would hopefully live beyond us and be handled by other creators. So uh, Marvel didn't have any sort of legal or moral obligation to keep me involved at, at any stage. So it's very nice that they have. And I'm so grateful that Josh and Stephanie have 
uh, you know, ask for any input whatsoever. They certainly, they don't need me. Uh, and the show has been uh, great. So, yeah, it, it's been the ideal. It's a dream come true, uh, really, as a creator, to just have people come to you and say, not only do we have a vision, but we're going to do all the heavy lifting and make you look good. It's great. I just get to <laughs> hide in my basement and write comic books while <laughs> they go to endless casting meetings. Um, let's talk a little bit about adaptation. Because sure. I was wondering about, you've got this, Got the comic in which the inciting incident, and they get on the run very early on after the Pride ritual, but you guys have taken the decision to sort of not slow things down, but establish a lot more. And you're not only are you translating something from uh, a comic to television, but even our kind of concepts of television are mm -hmm. shifting almost every month, you know, with a new show mm -hmm. about what you can and can't do and how fast or slow you need to go. So coming from the background that you guys came from, what were some Which of the is moving too fast through story? No, not at all. <laughs> I mean, I'm curious well. about like what kind of conversations you had about like this should happen in episode X or Y mm -hmm. or Z, and what were some of those early conversations, Brian? Were you a part of the breaking of the story, and how did you guys kind of talk about breaking the story for this season? Yeah, I mean, I think for us it was always about how do we take those first 18 issues in that first volume where the story really is the Runaways versus the Pride, mm -hmm. and open that up and unpack that and live inside that story for as long as possible, and so that meant. Talk, a lot of conversations about the pride themselves and the parent characters and 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 you know we talked to Brian a lot about sort of the storytelling choices that were made and things that inspired you know those decisions and how would he feel if we did this or that um, so it was very much a collaborative conversation yeah and Marvel originally in letting us play in the sandbox the first thing that we did is we went off and we wrote a spec script um, that had no home in mind so it wasn't written for a specific buyer it was just mm -hmm. kind of written like what we thought it should be, and we wrote um, a pretty extensive Bible, um, and we shared those materials with uh, Brian because we wanted to make sure that <laughs> he was happy and that we hadn't done anything um, heretical. Mm -hmm. uh, got some pretty positive feedback. <laughs> Absolutely. Was yeah. the visual look of the show pretty instrumental? Like, was it? Did the Bible have a lot of stuff about how the show would look eventually? Um, the Bible was more about uh, sort of mythology and backstory and. Um, you know, pride, pride mythology, and kind of where we saw the show going in the future. And uh, but it was always a map it was always about being grounded in our yeah. real world, yeah. in Los Angeles, and in um, you know these these homes and where. Like there was a lot of conversations about okay, well, who lives in the Palisades and who lives in Brentwood and who lives in Malibu. <laughs> right. So it was the Californians in a writer's yeah, room. Kind yeah, of yeah. Was, <laughs> right. there was a lot of that um, because that was important, and we really wanted to lead with the with the reality of the story. And then when we ended up hiring Brett Morgan to direct the, the first episode, obviously he has an extensive background in documentaries and very little in scripted. And he's like, well, if you guys are calling me about directing this, then clearly you're looking for something different. Yeah. So the approach was always about characters first, um, setting it in our world and making that, because it gets pretty, I mean, there's a dinosaur, there's a magic staff, there's some crazy <laughs> shit happening. Although not magic apparently, right? That's true. <laughs> magic, uh, at least as far as the... It's in quotes. Magic. It's in quotes. Magic in quotes. I think there is a little bit of a tendency, I've noticed this with some shows, many many of which I like quite a bit, that you will always have more good ideas, so get all your good ideas out as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. And I felt like this, sh this show was paced a little bit differently, where it was mm -hmm. like, I could tell that you were... <laughs> like, no, no, where I, I could say like you those must good have more good the, ideas. Yeah. 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 waiting for the good ideas. Yeah. 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 You guys yeah. were yeah. seeding things, with the bad ideas. Yeah. Seeding things rather than... Yes. Blow. Like, for, yes. like, I love Ozark, but Ozark is like an entire season in one episode. The first episode of Ozark right. is right. like... Yeah. That's how the first season should end, right? Like, <laughs> no, in uh, our first... Our Bible... Or our first version of the script was was closer structurally to Brian's first issue, which is they they find they witness the sacrifice pretty early on. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the first act. Yeah, like mm -hmm. fifteen Teaser. pages into the script. When we landed wow. at Hulu we got a note that you never get, which is, could you take the end of your teaser and make that the end of the show and open up this whole world of characters mm, right. and really dig into the emotional lives of these characters? Usually, if you're at a network, they're like, could you take the end of your episode and make that the end of the teaser? So, or the end of season one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the end of season one, the end of the teaser. So that was a great luxury, and that led to a lot of really interesting conversations about like who were these kids before they show up for this for this event it's amazing because as a fan of the comic for a long time um and i would go back and read it and say oh there's just so much here that could uh, that could work in tv it's right there and then of course the actual work of making tv is very different and brian you've worked in tv as well mm -hmm. um pretty extensively <clears throat> so i can imagine you had similar thoughts which is on the page it's so cool to see the pride and each parent group has their own supervillain costume and they're all yeah. completely articulated differently um and then also for you, Josh and Stephanie, you know, one of the hallmarks of the OC and Gossip Girl as well is that the kids and the parents were interesting mm -hmm. and you gave time to both. Um, 
then you walk into a TV show where you have to have 12 parents be in the cast yeah. and then that's, six. That's, there's a the reason we killed the Hernandez's off. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that's what I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a pretty easy fix right away. Yeah, that but, was early. Stephanie's like, I did the math. And uh, <laughs> fine. Ba- balance your regulars. I Balancing, this is hard. I have a great pitch for a mystery. <laughs> and it will cost us uh, less in casting. That's smart. But, but this, is a, this is a balancing act that is got to be a challenge even now when you're making the show because you have a huge cast mm-hmm. to service and not just to service, but to establish. With yeah, and, and I, we know that, and yet it's felt kind of, it hasn't felt like that in breaking the story. Like the characters that, you know, obviously that started in the book are so distinct, um, and the runaways themselves just pop off the page. So those characters came so fully mm-hmm. formed, um, and the parents themselves also, it just felt, I don't know, it felt effortless for in terms of those stories laying out. Mm-hmm. Um, no, and it did inspire the idea of doing the f- second episode as a rewind of the first episode mm-hmm. where you see the events from the point of view of the parents until a certain point, and then you, the story catches up. Because um, we just felt like if we can really establish those characters early, you'll know who they are, you'll be able to be invested in their stories, and you're not going to be in the middle of episode six going like, wait, whose parents are those? Mm-hmm. Like, no, it makes a lot of sense, too, because if you done if two is just like a continuation mm-hmm. like that, then I think you're still trying to piece together the distinctions between the parent characters because yeah. they show up so right. intermittently in the first episode. So I, 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 that's what I really liked about the second episode. Although I also remember going back and I, I just yesterday went back and reread Runaways 1 for the first time in a while and I just didn't remember that Alex's dad just fully stabs the girl to death. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a... Uh, I, I think I remember originally in the comic, it was actually they, I think they, they sacrificed a baby. And I think <laughs> someone at Marvel was like, please, Brian, this is so gruesome. Can you, this is ostensibly a kid's book that you're writing. And suddenly so it's a teenage prostitute <laughs> getting stabbed. As, oh, yeah, first all. day in the writer's room, Brian's like, what if it's a baby? <laughs> uh, finally, I can tell my yeah. story and speak my truth. But it is, I, I do know whenever I've met with adaptations and people say, oh, mm-hmm. the, the comic is just storyboards for the show or the movie right. were set, I know that it is doomed because, really? yeah, these are wildly different mediums. And so I, I'm always, I'm eager for the changes. Well, I wanted you to, ask, to talk specifically about that because um, obviously right now one of the books you're writing is, is Saga, which is just this glorious creation by you and Fiona Staples. And I've heard you say in other interviews, feel free to say it in this one too if you feel so inspired, <laughs> but you know, one of the joys of writing that is you're writing it to be a comic book, right. um, specifically to be a comic book. It is not storyboarding for any other medium and it is just exploding the glories of what you can do in a comic book among those things are in your main cast are fuck robots who are also royalty um, there's also a delicate way to put it but yeah, this, this, is, fuck this robots. is an adult, adult uh-huh. show um, you have a ghost nanny with her entrails hanging out these are main characters this would be hard to do even on Hulu's no doubt expansive budget um, can you talk about the, the, the glories of comics and why certain things not just for budgetary reasons why certain things work on panels and may, they might not work on the screen. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a very different medium, one that the audience has a little bit more interaction with. Mm-hmm. The, you're sort of in charge of the pace of reading a comic. It's a little bit more immersive that way. But, I mean, there are drawbacks. I just think the music and the Runaways show, both the sort of needle drop songs and the score, are so incredible. And that's just something that comics, obviously, we don't have uh, the the benefit of music. So there are things that I like about each medium. But yeah, comics in particular with Saga was just my frustration of, oh, here's the, the sort of big budget spectacle that I like, but you can't bring that to sort of a, a cable mature, you know, drama. So how can you combine the two? That's something really only comics can do at present. Josh will make you some playlists for people yeah. to listen okay. to while they, must, they read. They must be able to incorporate it into one of these like comicsology apps or something. That you yeah, could. like you. Yeah, I mean, if they can do it with greeting cards, you should yeah. be able to do it with comic books. Let's right? get on this. Just they, I don't know. They got those this. motion comics out there, which always seems to me to combine like the worst of animation <laughs> with the worst of comics. I was wondering too about like when you're watching. You know, it, there was a moment like in the I think it's in the first episode. Gert's walking behind. You mm-hmm. know, and she's like talking about the tutoring, and there, it's just such a great the way the scene is played and staged is so great but there because there are so many little gestures that the actors will do that brings that scene even more to life and when you see something like that where it's actual you know these representations of things that you've been writing for such a long time I mean, what's that like to watch I mean it's incredibly satisfying yeah. when it's done as well as it's been done here and just it does uh, you know one of the big joys of the comic was working with Adrian Alfona who hadn't really done comics mm-hmm. before 
and his style was so unique and most young comic artists feel like they're sort of aping someone else and Adrian just looks like himself and he was so sort of uh, ahead of his time and mm-hmm. I've talked about how his designs were so good I'd always thought the runaways would eventually get dopey costumes to run around in and his sense of fashion was so unique that I was like nah let's just let them be kids and to sort of see that translated not just the the faithfulness to the characters but the look and vibe of the comic is uh, that's something I, I didn't anticipate that was actually happen. something that our costume designers both commented on was just like oh god what like where is this going right. <laughs> what yeah. you know and they were so just because of like when are they going to put the costumes on and you know what what are they wearing in the panels that we're going to have to match to and they loved the comic was so like enmeshed in the time and contemporary and so much thought and detail had put in and put into all that stuff and we do get into the carolina flair jeans what do you call them the yeah. britney uh, slave, uh, yeah. britney slave for you jeans is that what it was yeah, yeah. it was like i know we have we're gonna try and like do easter eggs for the fans, <laughs> but that's one we're not gonna do the hardest part of the adaptation honestly was figuring out how to work in a reference to arsenic and old lace yeah. <laughs> yeah. brian's like good luck with that one that's a tricky one yeah We'll have more from Brian K. Vaughn, Stephanie Savage, and Josh Schwartz in just a moment, but first a word from our sponsors. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Hotel Tonight. Let's take a second to chat about our sponsor, Hotel Tonight, an awesome app for finding and booking great deals at great hotels. The holidays are coming up, and you know what that means, lots of family time. But with Hotel Tonight, you can have the best of both worlds. Visit your family and stay in a sweet hotel. I am doing this in Philadelphia, going home to visit my mom for Christmas. But you know what? Why not a little bit of a Philly staycation? So that's what I'm doing. No crashing on air mattresses in your old bedroom that your parents turned into a gym. You don't even have to wait until your family starts to drive you crazy. You can book up to seven days in advance everywhere and up to 100 days in advance in certain major cities, which means you can lock down your holiday plans before you head home. Or wait until the last minute if that's more your speed and take a break when Uncle Tony starts talking politics. Whether you need a room for tonight, the holidays are beyond, you definitely want to download the Hotel Tonight app because while home is where the heart is, hotel is where the room service is. So this year, pull out of the pullout couch and get a room with Hotel Tonight. Today's episode of The Watch is also brought to you by Sci-Fi's Happy. It's lonely being a degenerate a-hole unless you have an imaginary flying blue horse to talk to. Then it's just weird. This December, horses fly in Sci-Fi's twisted new series, Happy. Christopher Maloney stars as a corrupt ex-cop turned hitman who is adrift in a world of casual murder, soulless sex, and betrayal. After a hit gone wrong, his inebriated life is forever changed by a tiny, relentlessly positive, imaginary blue-winged horse named Happy, voiced by Pat Oswalt. Nick reluctantly partners up with Happy to find a little girl who was kidnapped by a deranged Santa. It's like a cop show on acid with a twisted redemption story and the ultimate odd couple. The show has one WTF moment after the next. Oh, and it is based on the extremely graphic novel by Grant Morrison and Derek Robertson. Happy premieres December 6th at 10, 9 central on Sci-Fi. And now back to our interview with Brian K. Vaughn, Josh Schwartz, and Stephanie Savage. Just in terms of the, 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 the process, the processes that Brian alluded to being happy to be removed from, like just casting and imagining and visualizing and then grouping together, mm-hmm. um, how, how difficult was that process? And what were your kind of um, benchmarks along the way? What did you know you needed to accomplish as you were seeing people, as you were putting groups of them together? Well, I think, first of all, our goal was, like, as Brian was saying, it wasn't going to be a literal translation of the book where you could just flip the comic book on screen and that would be the story that there would be some changes but it was always essential to us that the spirit of the comic book be translated um, and obviously that starts with the the alchemy and the chemistry of of the runaways themselves and when those kids started to come in and you started to oh my god that's Gert and mm-hmm. you know Allegra Acosta walks in and before she's even started reading lines you're like that's Molly like she's just yeah. so effusive and joyous Joyful, um, yeah. you know Greg Sulkin walks in and every woman in the room and some men are swooning and you're like, well, that's Chase, you <laughs> yeah. know? Um, but he has like a really sweet side to him that will be surprised. And, and you start to see that the first time we saw them all together um, was really exciting and it felt like, you know, felt special. Yeah. And then I think for me, it was really important. I am not a comic book person. I fell in love specifically with this book and the mm-hmm. characters in the world that Brian created and the voice and the humor that was there and the heart. Um, 
that it worked for everybody. So as much as we were going to be excited about, like, there have to be pinball machines in the games room and, you know, Alex needs to wear these kind of glasses, which I love all that stuff. But it also, if you didn't hadn't seen anything and didn't know anything, yeah. that you would never feel like you weren't invited to this show, that no big hand came up in your face and said, this isn't for you, this is only for people who know, you know, the comic already. Yeah, I mean, we see that a lot. Like, I think that it's changed a little bit in the last two seasons, but with Thrones, there was a lot of, like, people just sort of being like, well, it's not quite exactly how that's supposed to happen, or, you know, it, or the faithfulness of it was something that people really championed. One thing that we talk a lot about on the pod is this idea of Trojan horsing. Of like, you have a story that you want to tell, but you sort of dress it up, whether it's with genre or, you know, mm-hmm. a lot recently with superhero. And we, we would talked a lot, like, when was it Winter Soldier came out about like they were trying to make a 70s thriller that was going and they, ins- yeah. they said they yeah. were inside <laughs> of it. view. Yeah, sure, exactly. Right. Yeah. And uh, with this one, you know, you guys are obviously veterans of working on grizzled these, veterans, please. Grizzled <laughs> yeah. veterans of uh, working on like teenage themed shows. Mm-hmm. But it, I don't feel like this is like a Trojan horse thing. I feel like that you guys have as much uh, veneration for the actual mythology around you know, the superhero stuff that's happening within this story. And it's not just like, well, what we really wanted to do is make a high school show, but we'll, we'll top it with this. Right. Um, do you guys ever think about things in those terms? Do Absolutely. You, or I'm sure we, by pitching stuff, they're like, well, we'd love to get this from you, but could you put a superhero in it? Yeah, no, we talked a lot when we were doing the OC originally that that was a Trojan, that, you know, Fox mm-hmm. wanted 90210, and there was a lot of talk of like, okay, if Ryan is our Luke Perry, who's our, you know, Brandon, right? right? It was Brandon? Yep. Yeah. Jason <laughs> Priestley. Jason who was Gabriel Carteris? <laughs> <laughs> uh, still being determined. Um, we haven't worked that one out. But but that, we so we had to deliver a certain amount of beaches and, you know. Bikinis. Yeah, and bikinis. And we would have delivered that fights. anyway. Yeah. But hopefully that the characters would be surprising. The adults would be more built out than you expected. So if we could provide the trappings of the yeah. show they were looking for, then we could sneak our, our characters in. Yeah. yeah, at that point in time, you could not have pitched, we really want to make My So-Called Life or Freaks and Geeks, because those shows did not last a whole mm-hmm. season. Yeah. They were canceled. But you could pitch 90210, and then that kind of came together like 90210, but the Seth character was definitely someone who had never been in a nighttime soap opera yeah. before. So It's interesting to hear your answer to that, Stephanie, because it, in my mind... Um, I was expecting almost a different take on things because the OC, like when, when we first met years ago when you were making that show, that was a time when Fox, one of the big four, was like, let's put young people on television um, and let's also, you know, let's let the adults be characters. There mm-hmm. was a type of show that was quote unquote broadcast that has been, I think, almost either narrow casted out mm-hmm. of existence yeah. or pushed to very specific broadcasters no, for sure. only. And so I, you know, I, I wondered if that was just part of the business now, which is in order to tell those types of stories, you have to add. Um, you know, in the case of the Runaways, you have to add the superheroics, or in the case of Gossip Girl, you have to add um, the fantasy land known as the Upper East Side. There has to be <laughs> the thing around the thing. But to, but here you say it, there was already there was a totally there was just a different set of gatekeepers and and uh, expectations then. Yeah, I think so. And, and that show in particular worked for Fox because nine hundred two one zero I think was a part of its mm-hmm. fundamental DNA. And mm-hmm. I don't think you could have sold that show to ABC or NBC at the time, or even the WB, Peter Roth was like, that's a Fox show. So now I think it's interesting because one of the things that we talked about is with Runaways is this idea that if it's a, if it's a quote teen show, does that mean if we write this show on spec, which we were doing, does it have only, you know, these two or three homes because Mm -hmm. they're really the only places where you can put teens on TV? Right, right. Or if we try and make it work for, you know, a, a network, are they going to say, uh, you know, we need more about pride and can they be a, a law firm or can they help doctors <laughs> well, and do cases? Yeah, I'm listening to something here. Yeah. Um, you know, no bad ideas. Yeah, no exactly. bad ideas in the pitch. A divorced woman restarting her life. With their cardiothoracic surgery. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're just spitballing here. Yeah. So uh, Hulu actually turned out to be a great home because they were really comfortable with us doing both. Um, and I realize we've been talking um, about your relationship separately, but we haven't actually talked about the specifics yeah. of how, how it functioned. Like, you guys got, uh, got the go-ahead, the green light, to, to work on the show. Um, then 
you reach out to Brian. Obviously, mm-hmm. just, I, I believe the word heretical was used. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've ever used that before. Well, you know, podcast. first, if, it's very important to, to Jeff Loeb, who, you know, who runs, who runs Marvel, Marvel Television yeah. and obviously is a writer and has written comic, that it was really important to him that Brian be a part of the process early on and sort of get the materials early. Um, and so when he reached out to Brian and we heard that Brian liked it, then we set the lunch. <laughs> that makes sense. Otherwise, 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 yeah, otherwise yeah, what yeah. meal would it have been? Once we knew he wouldn't like be it. mad at us, uh, we set the lunch. And and then we at the at the meal, we said, uh, you know, please come into the writer's room. Come, hang out. We want you to be a part of this as much as you want, but you are invited. Please. And, and, he, w- and was anyone in the room when you got there? Or had they given you the address of, like, <laughs> fake writer's room? Yeah. Here's it's the room like we're good keeping fellas. You. I just walked in. And there oh, was this. man. What's this plastic doing on the ground? And uh, and and Brian was like, I don't know, I don't want to be that guy, I don't want to make it weird for people, I want everyone to feel the freedom to like, you know, uh, uh, pitch their ideas and say what they don't like and what they want to change. And we said, just come for lunch on the first day. And we were very fortunate that he came for lunch on the first day and had a good time and came back, I think, for the first month. Yeah, I just I yeah. wouldn't leave. Was lunch yeah, that good? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was really well, good. I mean, it's free food. I didn't <laughs> yeah. realize that I don't have to pay out of like pocket for sugar this. Sugarfish day one, we got them hooked. It's yeah. Smart. Yeah. Was your experience uh, on Lost must have given you like an appreciation for the things that happen in that room? And sure, and, and yeah, I, no, I, I've done well. a yeah. few writers' rooms, and they're really hard. And, and that was the nice thing about this. Even before the uh, casting began, is it was such a diverse, inclusive room of writers, and yeah. I like the writers so much. Mm-hmm. And uh, you could tell that. Uh, you know, they came from many different backgrounds, and they were each going to bring something interesting and new to the the show. So, yeah, I think I just wanted to be there to give permission. You know, uh, not that they needed it, but early on, yeah, there was that talk at Hulu about can we slow things down a bit. I wanted to let them know. I, I wish we had had the luxury to do that with the yeah. comic. That when we were doing Runaways, I was always sure we're going to get canceled by issue five or so. So that's why we had this breakneck pace of let's just every idea we ever had just pump them out in each issue and if I'd known we'd had the luxury of an entire season I'd say let's slow things yeah, down a little bit. but I feel bit. like this is a recurring theme with you because I also read that you had it planned out for Saga after five and or six or something. Man and anything <laughs> I've ever done always has an escape hatch for uh, look the things are going to go south because they usually do. One interesting thing to realize and as we're talking about it now that you Brian you said that you were a um, young comic book writer when you, you to break into Marvel with this young teen book you were writing teenagers then when Britney Spears was wearing those jeans. <laughs> yeah. um, Josh and Stephanie, you've written teens to different eras of your own lives. Mm-hmm. Um, Saga, obviously. That's our focus on the parents now. <laughs> well, this is what I'm talking about. Exactly yeah. that. Because you know, Saga is a book about parenting from the parents' perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, the parents are a key role in this as well. How do you, and I, and I guess I'm throwing out to all of you because I'm curious how you do that in your work, Brian, then also for you guys in the TV show that you're writing and continuing to develop. Try to stay true to the young people's voice because that is important in entertainment and in your work. But also, we're all in different places. <laughs> I'll, I'll include myself. Yeah. We're all in different places now. If you were writing Runaways now, it might be a different book, I guess. Is, oh, is, no, no doubt. Yeah. I was would writing, definitely I was... have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And most baby. That would be the thing. to the man. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I think I, I fancied myself at the time as young. Where I'm like, oh, I understood both sides mm-hmm. of this equation yeah. very well, both the young people and the parents. And then, yeah, uh, Saga is a comic book uh, about a response to actually becoming a parent and realizing that, oh, your parents, they're not gods. or per- They're just— Or supervillains. You no, know, they're just very sleepy people trying to do <laughs> yeah. an incredibly difficult job. So, yes, I have a lot of newfound sympathy <laughs> for parents that, yeah, this felt like such an opportunity with this show, that the— the parents in the comic book were, you know, hopefully not too mustache twirly, but they're villains. And I, I love the idea of a show that gives them as much weight as the children and we get to know them as well as the runaways is terrific. And hopefully that they're not villains, you know, in the traditional sense. Our, our pride, once you get to know them, they're compromised, they're in over their heads, they've made some decisions that they regret, like any adult. Sure. sure. You know? Yeah. Uh, but at least they didn't sacrifice a baby. Well, <laughs> that's, that's true. They did They do, They do. do a teenage uh, runaway, so that was nice of them. And in terms of, like, speaking to the, the voices of the uh, of the kids today as we get our older, I mean, that's where the cast can be incredibly helpful mm-hmm. in trying to have a mind meld with your actors, because obviously they are the age of the characters. Mm-hmm. They're they're on the streets speaking that slang and <laughs> watching, you know, finding those memes. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and let the record show that Josh pointed to Chris because yeah. he's the youngest <laughs> among he's, us. He's, 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 yeah. Sort of got in my corner. Yeah. 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 Um, but like we, were, you know, Ariella plays Gert. You know, we were talking about you know her speech in the classroom in the first episode where she's laying out her undermining the patriarchy club, 
And Ariella called us and, and she's like, listen, this is um, interesting. I appreciate this third wave feminism that you guys are espousing, <laughs> but, yeah. but I'm actually into fourth wave feminism <laughs> now. You missed a wave, guys. You missed a wave. It's a new and, so, wave. and so Stephanie and I were like, great, yeah. bring us into the fourth Good wave. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and Allegra, who's 14, is constantly teaching me uh, yeah, new, all kinds of new slang. New well, she's fifth wave. Yeah, she's yeah. fifth wave, yeah. Um, we should probably -feminist. wrap yeah. it up, but I, I do, since it's towards the end of the year, wanted to just ask you guys if there was anything on, it doesn't have to be TV, but I'd be curious to know, anything that blew you away this year? TV wise, ooh, blown away is like strong language. Yeah. Oh wow, I have to literally even headline think about everything Stephanie I've Savage. Seen. Nothing blew me away. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, I'll jump on the Deuce bandwagon. Nice. Yes. So I think that it's you're, you're sitting here at the bandwagon. Okay, this is actually <laughs> it's terrific. Yeah. I just think it's uh, and it felt like that first season of The Wire, where the first couple of episodes is like, okay, I'm still getting the lay of the land yeah. and finding out all these characters and there were somewhere around the fifth or sixth episode they're like oh I'm deep in yeah this is a lot to say about the world right now in a very unexpected way so mm -hmm. yeah I'm loving the deuce um I would say I loved the Spider-Man movie that came out this year. It was like, what if Michael J. F what if Marty McFly got to be Spider-Man? <laughs> yeah. It was such a fusion of so many loves. Uh, Big Sick, Good Place is excellent. Less, that's, that, that's culture. That's good. That's good, right? You watch stuff. Oh, yeah. I see stuff. I was at Guns N' Roses for 17 hours last night. <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew you were going to find a way to bring that in. Yeah. I did really like Handmaid's Tale. Mm -hmm. I'm Canadian. Shout out so to Hulu. Everybody grew up reading that novel. I thought you were going to say you knew everyone in it. it was <laughs> yes, and I knew, I knew a lot of the supporting <laughs> actors. But I thought it did a great job of adapting material that is really tough to adapt and was very beautifully directed and acted and kind of just elevated everything in a way that I think did kind of create like a new template for a sort of like poetic television. Yeah. Big Little Lies also. Oh, yeah, People who do great. the nighttime serial drama. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you appreciate that. Nice and, and that yeah. was actually really interesting because um, I thought so, because David Kelly wrote it. And if you actually just like listen to it, you're mm -hmm. like, yeah, that sounds like David Kelly. Like he didn't learn to write in right. a new way. Right. It just the execution completely came together in a way that transformed it into something, you know, super unique and, and that we they haven't shot seen before. entirely on a beach, too. So, yeah. <laughs> so there's that. And One Red Morgan's uh, documentary, Jane. Oh, nicely done. Thank you. Oh. Uh, one last thing before I let you go about the show. Um, They're going to run away. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was my question. Yeah. Uh, but really, you said, you know, you have the 18 issues, the first 18 issues as sort of a, a Bible, a, a different kind of Bible. Mm -hmm. um, as you were developing this first season and hopefully beyond, how far beyond those 18 books have you considered? Are you excited to get to? How much have you told Brian about deviating? <laughs> do you want to do it now on live on microphone? Well, we have. Uh, we're talking about plans for season two mm -hmm. that will go beyond uh, where that final book in the first volume ends. Um, and I think we're going to be incorporating some new ideas that are not in the books oh. and then taking... Hopefully some ideas from Brian. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully getting some more ideas from Brian. What do you guys think about baby killing? <laughs> <laughs> and then thinking about how what things from future issues we want to incorporate in our second season. And there's definitely some th ideas being bandied about. Looking back now from the vantage point of finishing the first season of the show, would you put CGI dinosaurs in all your shows? Like, is that... Do you realize that that yeah, was the secret sauce? She's mostly puppet. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. It's an incredible puppet. It took 35 minutes. We broke news. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's not news, actually. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's this incredible puppet and designed by, like, the team that designed the dinosaur puppets for Jurassic Park. It's like a six-person... Um, so it's team. not one dinosaur, it's six kids inside a dinosaur? Yeah, it's very <laughs> similar to, uh, it's the BoJack Horseman trench coat <laughs> situation. But it's, uh, it's like six people operating every eye blink and nostril flare, and it's wow. this incredibly lifelike um, creature that it's been great for the actors, too. It's much better to bond with that than a tennis Do you those guys ball. only make dinosaur puppets? Like, they are should, because they they're so the good at it. You know? They're so good I, at it. Yeah. I just think, you know I love the OC, but if every time they went back to Chino, there was also a dinosaur just, <laughs> just roaming the streets. Just a raptors. Just a couple. Just, I mean, because yeah. yeah. just to increase the feeling of tension and otherness. Yeah. By the way, somewhere out there, Fox is listening, going, <laughs> it's, it's time. time to reboot. It's it's time to reboot. Yeah. All right. Um, well, thank you all three of you for joining us today, and um, best of luck with the rest of the first season. And, Brian, I hope you'll also come back sometime so we can geek out with you over Saga and uh, would Paper Girls. Would you like us to step else. outside and you guys can <laughs> yeah. We considered it. We are yeah. looking at him the way the dinosaur looks at food. But no, we're, uh, we're good for today. Your episodes drop on Tuesday. Tuesday's on, uh, on the Hulu service. On the Hulu. Oh, can't even say network. What do you say? SVOD. I don't know. Hulu. Do you say SVOD? I don't say that. <laughs> Never say that again. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, Bye. Guys. Thank you. 
Today's episode of The Watch was brought to you by Hotel Tonight. It's an awesome app for finding and booking great deals at great hotels. No crashing on air mattresses in your childhood bedroom this year. Instead, lock down your holiday plans with Hotel Tonight. Book a room up to seven days in advance everywhere and up to 100 days in advance in certain major cities or wait until the last minute. It's your prerogative. You can make a break for it when Uncle Tony starts talking politics. Whether you need a room for tonight, the holidays are beyond. You definitely want to download the Hotel Tonight app. Today's episode of The Watch was also brought to you by Sci-Fi's Happy this December. Sci-Fi's new series Happy starring Christopher Maloney as an ex-cop turned hitman and Patton Oswalt as his new partner who happens to be an imaginary flying blue horse thing. Oh, and it's based on an extremely graphic novel by Grant Morrison and Derek Robertson. Check it out. Happy premieres December 6th at 10, 9 central on Sci-Fi.